Today is December 5th, 2015. Okay, so we can start with homage to the Buddha three times. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Okay, good morning, everybody. So today I'm going to try an experiment <laughs> in covering two suttas in one one day. See, it's the practice of the Pali commentators, when they come at the beginning of the commentary, like the commentary to the Majjhima Nikaya, they'll spend pages and pages analyzing every word, even the expression evang me sutang, thus have I heard, gets like about four or five pages of explanation. But then when they come to the end of the commentary, they start rushing through. <laughs> <laughs> I'm following their, their model. But we're coming now to the, getting close to the end of the Majjhima Nikaya. We only have three more classes during this semester. But our early next semester is starting in the spring. Yeah, this week I'll try to take 143 and 147, because there's a little bit of an affinity between them. Then next week, 144 and 145, because at least one helps to illuminate the other. So that will leave just 146, 148, 149, 50, 51, 52. But what do we do when we come to much many higher 152? Anybody know? No. <laughs> we still have to do Machi Mini Kaya Sutta number one. Oh, she had it. She was writing her finger. Wow, so she's really keeping track of what's going on. She has been looking forward to number one. Yeah, because I left number, number one is very concise and very cryptic. So if you just, I don't know why the compilers put it at the very beginning of the Machi Mini Kaya. Because if you open it and try to read it, you just can't figure it out. But after you've gone through the rest of the Majjhima Nikaya, then we can understand it, or start to understand it. Okay, so now we're taking Sutta number 143, and this is the <coughs> Sutta, it's called the Anatta Pindikovada Sutta, the Sutta of the here it's called advice to Anatta Pindika, but Ovada is not really advice. I mean, the guy's dying, what kind of advice do you, do you give him? <laughs> but it's rather, Ovada is more like an exhortation, a kind of like an inspired discourse. Okay, so this tells us the sutta starts when the Buddha is living at Sapati in the Jeta's Grove, which is also called Anatta Pindika's Park, because this was, according to the explanation, the commentaries, originally this woods, this kind of woods, had belonged to the prince who was the king, uh, the son of the king of Kosala. His name was Prince Jeta. And Anatta Pindika, when he gained, he was a resident of, Sra of Sabati, and when he learned about the Buddha in Rajagaha, which is quite a distance away, then he invited the Buddha to come to teach in Savati, and he wanted to build a monastery for the Buddha. And so he was looking around for a suitable pl place, 
And what did he find but a nice piece of land near Carmel, New York? I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, the city of, of Sabati. And so he purchased that piece of land from Prince Cheta, and there he built the monastery. And this became what we call the Buddha's main seat of residence. So the Buddha traveled around through most of the year, but during the rains retreat, it was called the Vasa, the rainy season, most or a great number of the rains retreats he spent at Anattapindika's monastery. And so because the Buddha was living there, he forged very close relations with the citizens of Savati. So King Pasenadi, the king of the state of Kosala, whose capital was at Savati, he became a devoted supporter of the Buddha. And then the Buddha's chief male benefactor, or donor, was Anattapindika, and also the Buddha's chief female supporter, a laywoman by the name of Visaka. She was also a resident of Savati. And so the Buddha had actually two residences at Savati. One was Anattapindika's monastery, which I believe was probably <coughs> to the west of the city. And then the lay devotee Visaka she set up a residence for the Buddha, which was called the Eastern Park, Pubarama. And so when the Buddha, sometimes he would live in Anattapindika's monastery, sometimes, perhaps it was a little more remote, so for more better seclusion, he would go to Visanka's monastery, the Eastern Park. And so, because of the Buddha was living much of the time in Sabati, Anattapindika became very closely associated with the Buddha and developed great devotion to the Buddha. And in fact, under the Buddha's guidance, actually the first, with his first encounter with the Buddha, when the Buddha gave a discourse to him, Anattapindika became a Sotapanna, a stream mentora. I don't think there's any account in the canon of Anathapindika going further along the path to the stage of once returner, which seems a little strange, but that's the way it is. Okay, so this sutta, one gets the impression, must be taking place pretty much towards the end of the Buddha's own lifespan, not during his last, very last days, but now the Buddha would be Maybe he's in the late 70s, and Anatta Pindika is now an elderly man. And so now he's fallen ill. And so this sutta is going to be the discourse given to Anatta Pindika on his deathbed. Okay, so the sutta tells us that on this occasion, Anatta Pindika was afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. This is a stock expression used in the suttas whenever anybody gets seriously ill. Most of the time when they are described in this way, they'll recover from their illness. But we'll see this doesn't happen with the Nathapindika. Okay, so Nathapindika, when he's very ill, he wants some inspiration and consolation, and so he sends a message to the Buddha. So he addresses, he's, he's a very wealthy man, Ananda Pindika. He's what is called a sati. That is like a, a wealthy man who provides finances to the state. And so he has a servant, he sends the servant to the Buddha and says, please go to the Blessed One, pay my respects to him by bowing down at his feet, tell him that I'm very gravely ill, and then go to the Venerable Sariputta, pay respects to him, give the same message to him, and then ask Venerable Sariputta to come to my residence out of compassion. 
a lo campa lo padaya. It's a little puzzling. Why doesn't he ask the Buddha himself to come? You know, I don't know the explanation. One might say, oh, the Buddha would have been old, so he didn't want to impose on him. But we see in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the discourse on the Buddha's last days, the Buddha takes a long tour from Rajagaha up to um, Kusinara, you know, covering several hundred miles. So if he could travel that distance in his very last, <coughs> last months of his life, he could have taken the walk from the monastery to Anathapindika's house. Maybe Anathapindika wasn't aware that he was going to die, and so he didn't want to impose on the Buddha. I don't know the answer. Anyway, so he sends the message to first to the Buddha, then to Sariputta, and then Sariputta goes to the to the residence of Anathapindika, and then he asked about his health. Again, this is a standard kind of formulation. I hope you are getting well, householder. I hope you are comfortable. I hope your painful feelings are subsiding and that they are not increasing. But Ananta Pindika says that this isn't the case. He says, I'm not getting well, I'm not comfortable, my pains are increasing. And then he describes his pains in very <laughs> vivid terms. He says, it's just as if a strong man were splitting my head open with a sharp sword. So too, violent winds cut through my head. Just as if a man were tightening a tough leather strap around my head as a headband, so there are violent pains in my head. Just as if a skilled butcher were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife, so violent winds are carving up my belly. And in the Indian, physiology of this period to medical analysis, what we would call, today we would call them sensations, these would be expressed as winds. Okay, just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals, so there is a violent burning in my body. So if you ever get ill and think you're undergoing a lot of pain, just bear this description in mind. <laughs> I've done this many times. <laughs> and then I think, I have this chronic head pain condition, but when I read this I think, ah, I'm just like floating on the air compared to this description. <laughs> okay, so now we come to the heart of this sutta, where Sariputta is giving the instructions, the actual instructions to Anatta Pindika. And perhaps Sariputta would have used his you know, supernormal knowledge or even maybe just empirical observation to realize that Anatta Pindika is on his way out. And so he's really going to be giving him advice now or instructions on how to train the mind as it comes into the death process so that one ha has a chance of liberation in that life itself. Okay, so Sariputta says, you should, I'm in paragraph five now, then householder, you should train thus, I will not cling to the I and my consciousness will not be dependent on the eye. And in the same way you should train regarding the ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. I will not cling to the mind, my con and my consciousness will not be dependent on the mind. Thus you should train. Okay, so here we have the key, sort of the key phrase 
which is going to continue through the whole rest of Sariputta's exhortation. <clears throat> Do you mind if I use the power? It's a very simple phrase, but it has very profound implications. So first we have na chakum upadi upadi sami, which is what is rendered here. I will not or shall not. It's like a, making a mental determination. I shall not cling to the I. And then na may chakum nisi tam vinyana and my consciousness will not be dependent on the eye will not be supported by the eye okay so what we see here is that there's actually a kind of conditional relationship here that through clinging to in this case to any of the sense the six sense bases The consciousness comes to rely upon, to be based upon, or to be attached to these six sense bases. And it's when consciousness becomes attached, supported, dependent on any of the six sense bases that this is what sort of supports consciousness as it makes the transition from one life to the next life. So we could say that there's this clinging, which is like holding to the six sense bases with the ideas, these are mine, this is I, this is myself. Holding to them with craving and with the view of self. So when there's that upadana, that clinging to any of these phenomena, that is providing the kind of fuel that will drive the consciousness on from this life into a new life. Because the consciousness is based upon, through clinging, it's based upon the six sense bases. And through that being based on the six sense bases in this life, through clinging, then the consciousness is going to pick up a new set of six sense bases <coughs> when one passes from this life. And then that will start the process of the next life, the new life. And actually the word upadana which is rendered clinging, is the etymology of the word is provides some insights into what is going on. Yeah, the base of the word adana 
has the meaning of taking. If you know the second precept in Pali, it's adina dhana viramani, that is abstaining from taking, that's adana, what is not given, adina. So this is taking, and then upa gives a stress of strengthening. a strengthening effect upon the word. So we can render it taking up. And so from upadana is taking up, we get clinging. But the idea of taking up also applies to the way a fire relates to its fuel. So the word upadana is also used to mean the fuel of a fire. And so Upadana is the fuel of a fire and clinging, Upadana as clinging, is the fuel that keeps the, say, the combustion process of consciousness burning. And when consciousness is losing its fuel in this life, because the body is about to expire, it needs to arise based on some new fuel. And that new fuel will be picking up the set of six sense bases that begins the new life. And so through upadana, through clinging, the consciousness is settled upon, based upon, supported by, dependent on, the, this set of six sense bases. And when, through the expiration of the life faculty, these six sense bases can no longer function as the supports for consciousness, then with upadana driving it, consciousness picks up a new set of six sense bases. And what happens when there is no upadana? Then what is said is that consciousness Parinibhayati, which one might render, you know, to make it decent English, it attains Nibbana. But if one is going to translate very literally following the Pali, Parinibhayati is a verb. So you would say consciousness becomes Nibbanaist, <laughs> or it becomes Nirvanaist. or sometimes use what's said using the simile of the fire, is that the consciousness, siti bhavati, it becomes cool, like the fire going out. Okay, so, first Sariputta, gives this exhortation, relating it to the six sense bases, but consciousness can cling to anything in the whole field of experience. So now Sariputta is going to go through different groups of phenomena. So he says, you should train thus, I will not cling to form, sounds, these are the six sense objects, form, sounds, odors, flavors, tactile objects, mind objects, then consciousness can cling to consciousness itself. You know, we cling to the experience of things through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. In that case, we're clinging to consciousness. So he's saying, I will not cling to the eye consciousness, and so to ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind consciousness. And then, once you have the six sense objects, the six sense faculties, the six sense objects, the six kinds of consciousness, then their encounter, their coming together, which initiates any particular act of experience, 
That is contact. So Sariputta continues, I will not cling to eye contact all the way through mind contact. And then out of contact there arises feeling or Vedana. And Vedana or feeling is usually the direct object of craving. And so what we crave is generally pleasant feelings through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind, or the peaceful, neutral feelings. And then when we encounter pain through any of the six senses, then we crave to escape that pain by indulging in some kind of pleasure. And so the training here given to Anathapindika, and this is probably to most directly relevant to him because he's undergoing these severe pains and his illness, is I will not cling to feeling born of eye contact, etc., born of body contact, born of mind contact. So even when one is experiencing painful feelings, of course one doesn't cling to them with the in the mode of desiring them, but one clings to them when one identifies with the painful feelings and thinks, oh, I have such a head headache, oh, such a stomach ache, oh, why does this have to happen to me, oh, I'm so miserable, I'm undergoing such suffering. So all of these thoughts of I and mine thoughts of identification that arise from the feelings, these are ways of clinging to them. So he's saying, do not cling to any of these feelings through any of the senses. Okay, then he brings in some other classes of objects. And I suspect that it could be that this was not part of the original discourse, but being added by the compilers just to make the discourse more complete. Though also it could have been, because Sariputta had a very analytical mind, so it could be that he's, he himself actually brought all of these other groups in. So we have, I will not cling to the elements. We have the six elements, the four material elements, the space element, and the consciousness element. Then we come paragraph 11, I will not cling to, here we have the five aggregates from material form, feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness. Then we come to, this would seem a little strange directed to Anatta Pindika because from what we can see he was not an advanced meditator, not an advanced jhanic meditator. And yet, here Sariputta is saying, I will not cling to the base of infinite space, I will not cling to the base of infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. These are the four immaterial attainments. So, I say it's a bit strange because, it, so far as I can see, I don't know of any sutta passages which speak of Anatta Pindika as being an attainer of the jhanas. And to reach the formless meditations, one has to go through the four jhanas. And this would be an advice that like a monk would give to somebody who was, you know, had this extraordinary ability in samadhi meditation. Because for somebody who gains samadhi, these formless samadhis, who would be the subtle clinging to them, would become the, the foundation or ground for the consciousness to become established upon them, and then to take rebirth in one of those formless realms of existence, where the lifespan is thousands of cosmic aeons, but it's not liberation. Okay, and with paragraph 13, 
Sariputta broadens the scope still further and he says, I will not cling to this world with the desire to come back to some you know, to some state of existence in this world. I will not cling to the world beyond you know, out of desire to be reborn in one of the heavens or any of the divine realms of existence. Then he takes all objects of experience comprehensively and says, I will not, whoops, I will not cling to what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized and counted, sought out after and examined by the mind, and my consciousness will not be dependent on that. Yeah, in this paragraph we actually have four, all of the, the objects of experience are grouped together into four sets. First we have the seen, which is identical with visible form, the heard, which is identical with sound, the sense, which is said to comprise everything, more, the, more, the grosser objects of perception, that is, um, anything smelled, tasted, and touched. In other words, odors, tastes, and tactile objects. And then all the following words are taken to represent objects of a purely <coughs> mental consciousness. That is, the main word here is cognize, vinyata, and then the other terms, encountered, sought after, examined by the mind, are just elaborations on cognize. And then my consciousness will not be dependent on that. Thus you should train. So that is Sariputta's ovada, his exhortation, his instruction to Anatta Pindika. So he's, you know, the purport is that he's advising Anatta Pindika not to be attached to anything within the subjective and objective domains of experience. And when there is not that attachment, not that clinging, consciousness will not be dependent upon it. When consciousness is not dependent upon it, then with your passing, your consciousness will parini bhaisati, it will be nirvanais, it will attain nirvana, go into, <laughs> go into nirvana, so to speak. Okay, so when Sariputta finishes his exhortation, then Anatik Pindika starts weeping and he sheds tears. And now uh, Ananda has gone along with Sariputta as his companion. And so when Ananda Pindika starts weeping, then Venerable Ananda, he thinks, oh, Ananda Pindika must be feeling miserable. And he must be really frightened and agitated that he's going to be dying and that he's going to be leaving behind all of his loved ones and his possessions. And so he thinks, so he says to, to Anatta Pindika, are you foundering householder, householder, <coughs> excuse me, are you foundering householder, are you sinking? Okay, then Anatta Pindika says something that seems a bit surprising and also a little bit puzzling, even to me. He says, I'm not foundering Bhante Ananda, I'm not sinking, but though I have long waited upon the teacher, the Buddha, and the venerable bhikkhus, never before have I heard such a talk on the Dhamma. Okay, then Ananda says 
to Anatta Pindika. He says, such a talk on the Dhamma, such Dhamma Katha, is not given to lay people clothed in white. Such talk on the Dhamma is given to those who have gone forth, in other words, to monastics. <coughs> Okay, this needs a little unpacking or drawing out. And I say it's a little puzzling because, okay, it's said in the commentaries that when the Buddha is giving many of these like profound discourses and this in the Majjhima Nikaya, Sanyutta Nikaya, though he says, oh bhikkhus, like he's addressing monks, but the commentaries say that actually the fourfold assembly is present so that there will be bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, Upasakas, lay, male lay devotees, male lay followers, and Upasika, women lay followers. So we see, I mean, from this we can see that lay people will also be listening to these discourses. But what I could say is that when Anatta Pindika comes to the Buddha for a personal discourse, the Buddha always speaks to him about, from the standpoint of the Dhamma, about how to conduct one's affairs as a householder. Like, what is the proper use of wealth? How is a lay person happy in the household life? <laughs> um, how does one take care of one's wife and children? Occasionally he'll speak about how a householder should go off in seclusion and reflect on the virtues of the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, on the virtues that reflect on his own practice of morality, generosity. You know, but one doesn't, I don't, I'm not aware of discourses and where the Buddha is speaking one-on-one, -on -one, so to speak, to Ananta Pindika where he says, don't be attached to anything seen, heard, sensed, cognized. And the reason, perhaps, is that Anatta Pindika was a, generally a very wealthy householder, a large household with a lot of affairs to take care of. He is reputed to have been as I said earlier, it's called in India a Saiti or Shresti, one with a lot of wealth, almost like the treasurer, the state, but not the actual treasurer, but like a banker, okay. <laughs> a banker, one with a lot of wealth who provides sponsorship to the king so that the king can conduct the affairs of state. <laughs> You know, the unholy alliance of the <laughs> politicians and financial institutions. But Anatta Pindika, of course, was a man of upright conduct. And so, for this reason, I think, the when the Buddha or the venerable monks are speaking to Sartu and not the Pindika. They don't speak to him, they don't give him these high, profound discourses. And there were some householders, though, who had very, very deep and very astute knowledge of the Dhamma and apparently high attainments in meditation, especially the one who's mentioned as outstanding in that respect is one called Chita, the householder, who has a whole chapter to himself in the Samyutta Nikaya. I think it's chapter 41. And Chita would sometimes invite the monks to come for an alms offering, and then he would give them, you know, coming, like playing the role of a simple householder, and he would give them a question, Bhante, what is the meaning of this? How do you explain that? And sometimes the monks would all be stumped by his question, and then since Chita has to take on a humble role, according to the monks, he would say, well, the way I understand it, it's this way. And actually, he's actually referring, in his explanation, back to a discourse by the Buddha. 
And then the monks would say, sadhu, sadhu, householder, you have such a clear and deep understanding of the Dhamma. You know, so I don't think this should be taken as a generalization. So not the Pindika is probably just explaining on the basis of his own experience. But Ananda's answer still has to be taken in the sense, again it needs a little interpretation, that probably what he means is that on an individual basis, this type of discourse is not given to householders and white because they are concerned with, you know, with all of the travails, the day-to-day -day difficulties of managing their household life. But if they come, <laughs> if they come in the evening to hear the evening discourse that the Buddha is giving to the monks, then they will get to listen to hear such discourses. Okay, but then. Anattapindika makes this great plea to Sariputta. <clears throat> he says, please, Bhante Sariputta, let such Dhamma talks be given to lay people clothed in white. And clothed in white, I should mention, because in the Asian countries, in India during the Buddha's time, in Sri Lanka today, when lay people, devout lay people, go to the monastery, they wear white. I think maybe because of the commercial, commercially produced clothing, that tradition is fading out. But in the earlier eras, earlier times, they would always wear white, particularly when they are undertaking the special precepts, then they wear the white clothing. Okay, so Anatta Pindika continues, please let such talks be given to the lay people clothed in white, there are clansmen, I should say clans people, or pe no, let's just say people, there are people with little dust in their eyes who are wasting away, who are, you know, fading away through not hearing such talk on the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. And what's interesting is, does anybody has anybody encountered those exact words before in a different context? I think it's a Sahabri when he went to the Buddha and pleaded to work. Exactly, exactly. If you remember, if you go back to Sutta number 26, and then, you know, don't look at it now, I'm just referring to it. If you look at Sutta number 26 in the Machima Nikaya, when after the Buddha's enlightenment, when he's sitting on the seat of a, near the Bodhi tree, and then he's pondering, should I teach the Dhamma to the world or not? And then it said he looks out at the world and he sees people are just so wrapped up in greed, hatred, and delusion. If I were to teach the Dhamma, nobody would be interested. They're all, you know, looking at their little <laughs> phones. <laughs> <laughs> all glued to their iPhone, iPhones or you know, iPads, and, what do they call them, tablets, and here, abandon greed, hatred, and delusion. Um, wait a moment, Bhante, there's some <laughs> interesting movie on <laughs> Or in this country, addicted to their guns. <coughs> and so, you know, the Buddha thinks, if I try to teach the Dhamma, they're not going to be interested. It's just going to be trouble for me, and it's not going to bring any good, do any good for the others. Okay, so when the Buddha has this thought, then a Brahma, a high divinity named Sahampati, he comes, he sort of vanishes from the celestial realm, he comes and appears in front of the Buddha, and he says, please, Bhante, don't think in that way. Look out at the world. There are some with little dust in their eyes who are fading away. 
to not hearing the Dhamma, they will be able to understand. And then the Buddha, when he hears our request, then he looks out again with his super Buddha vision upon the world, and then he sees that there are indeed people who can understand, and then he decides to teach. Okay, so that is Anatta Pindika's great request, or maybe his last words, to Sariputta. Okay, then, after giving this, after this discussion, Sariputta and Ananda leave Anatta Pindika's house, they go back to the monastery, and soon afterwards, Anatta Pindika passes away even though he might have been trying to meditate according to Sariputta's instructions, he didn't reach the goal. <laughs> so his consciousness was not yet parinibhayati, was not yet nirvanais. And so he passed away and he was reborn in the Tusita heaven. The Tusita heaven is one, two, three, the fourth level of the six sense fair heavenly realms. And that is said to be the abode where the Bodhisattva Maitreya, Maitreya, is now dwelling. And from there, when Gautama Buddha's teaching disappears, then at some time in the future, Maitreya Bodhisattva will descend from the Tusita heaven and come into the human realm and then become a Buddha. Okay, so Anatta Pindika is reborn in the Tusita heaven, and then it's said that in the, in the commentary it said that after he was reborn there, and he sees his heavenly uh, good fortune, and he ponders, how did I get to be, to arise here? How did I achieve such good fortune? And when he ponders on that question, then he sees that, ah, this all happened because of the merits that I accumulated as a supporter, a benefactor of the Buddha and the Sangha. And so then he thinks, let me come down and pay them a visit to express my appreciation. And so, of course, he doesn't come down like a human being, or he doesn't come in the middle of the day, but it's the practice that devas come to the Buddha, usually in the dead of the night, when everybody else is sleeping and everything is quieted down. I think this would have happened much more often back in ancient times when the world was very quiet and relatively I don't think the world was ever peaceful. I mean, there were wars going on all the time. <laughs> but we didn't have all of this electro electronic gadgetry, which I think creates, my opinion, this is not from the Pali commentary, <laughs> creates a kind of a, a, a vibrational field, which is uh, repulsive to the deities. And maybe it interferes with their own vibrational frequencies. And so they don't come down here to visit so often. But in the, I would think, in ancient times, when we didn't have all of this, you know, these kinds of powerful forms of energy, like electricity, this whole, and all of these communications, <coughs> lines of communication, electronic communication, and these, you know, polluting the world with all of these substances that we're burning, creating so much dirt and pollution, then the deities want to keep away, keep a distance. But in earlier times, there would have been much more, much easier communication between the divine realms and the human realm. So that's why we have like scriptures from the great religious traditions which speak about encounters, frequent encounters between the human and the divine. Okay, so here Anattapindika comes to the Buddha in the middle of the night and he recites some verses 
expressing his first his appreciation of the Jaita's Grove, which he himself had donated to the Buddha, and then giving some instruction on how to live the wholesome life, and then praising Sariputta. So he says, O oh, blessed is this Jaita's Grove, dwelt in by the sagely Sangha, wherein resides the king of the Dhamma, the Dhamma Raja, the Buddha, the fount of all my happiness. So that's praise of the grove, the Sangha, and the Buddha. Then he speaks like words of advice to the world. By action, knowledge, and Dhamma, by virtue and the noble way of life, by these are mortals purified, not by lineage or wealth. Therefore, a wise person who truly sees, who sees what truly leads to his own good, should investigate the Dhamma. I mean, that's significant coming from Anatta Pindika, who is not known to be an investigator of the Dhamma, and purify himself with it. And then he praises Sariputta. Sariputta has reached the peak in virtue, peace, and the ways of wisdom, any monk who has gone beyond at best can only equal him. Okay, so sorry, uh, Anatta Pindika recites these verses. The teacher, probably by silence, approves of them, or maybe he actually spoke approving them. And then Anatta Pindika vanished. Okay, then the next day, the Buddha addresses the monks and he tells them that he's sort of testing them. And he says, in the middle of the night, a young god of beautiful appearance came to me, illuminating this whole Jaita's grove. And after saluting me, then he recited these verses. Then he repeats the verses. And then he vanished. Okay, when he says this, then the Venerable Ananda says to the Buddha, he says, Surely, Bhante, that young deity must have been Anatta Pindika, for the householder Anatta Pindika had perfect or full confidence in the Venerable Sariputta. Okay, then what the Buddha says is interesting. He says, first he applauds Ananda. He says, good, good, Ananda. Then he says, the Pali goes, yava takkam takkaya pattabam anupattam tam taya, which means, very literally, as far as it might be reached by the thinking that by you has been reached. So that is a very literal rendering. For well, that by you, you have arrived at that. So that's what's translated here. As far as reasoning goes, you have drawn the right conclusion. Because, and then the Buddha says, that young God indeed was Anatta Pindika, no one else. Okay, the reason why the Buddha says this to Ananda is that Ananda is going by inference. He's drawing from the fact, probably first, that the deity praised Jaita's grove, and then he praised Sariputta. And so he thought that since Anatta Pindika has just died and our deity has appeared, and praise the grove and the Sariput, Sariputta, that must be Anatta Pindika. But the Buddha doesn't have to yava takkam takaya takkam. He doesn't have to go by thought, by reasoning. The Buddha himself knows directly that that was, Sari, uh, that was Anatta Pindika. 
Okay, and that is the discourse. Maybe we can take any questions that come up. We've okay, got... Richard, Richard has... You can pass the microphone down to Richard. There's two buttons on the mic. Uh, the lower one you want to push up, the upper one you want to push to the right, and it will be on. Hello? Okay. Uh, another intercut is a SATI. Is that S-A-T-I? No. no. In, in Pali it's SATI. SATI. Yeah. SATI. In Sanskrit it's SHRESHTI. Which it's a term that indicates a fairly wealthy person yeah. who provides finances. I think his role, probably they started out originally, I think yeah. this is the speculation, as gold merchants. Yeah. And then through dealing in gold, they accumulated a lot of wealth. And then they took on the role of providing wealth to the king right. with the assumption that the king will eventually pay them back. So he, so he would have been a Vaishya, right? Probably he was from the Vaishya. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the thing that I'm wondering about is that you're saying he was he was an upright man. Yeah. So I assume that means that he wasn't violating any of the precepts. Yeah. So you got the precept of right livelihood. Yeah. And you got the precept of non-killing. Yeah. Right. Meanwhile, when he when he's supporting the state, I mean, he's he's basically a a taxpayer, but at that time, it was like not more than 1% of the population that did that, right? So when he's supporting the state, yeah. he is the assumption that he's not thereby supporting killing, and mm -hmm. when he's when he's making his money by, by trading in gold yeah. and such, yeah. the assumption is that's right livelihood, yeah, first I'll take the second part. Okay. I'm assuming that gold would have been used as a medium of exchange. Yeah. And so this would be an essential me medium of exchange. Yeah. Well, so I don't see that it's a wrong life. No, I, I suspect that at the time, yeah. gold was used by relatively few people. It was the rich who had yeah. gold. Yeah. Other, other people would have had the same kind of problem that's described yeah. in the Bible in Jerusalem, where, for instance, mm -hmm. people were obligated to pay their taxes yeah. in Roman currency, which they didn't have. Yeah. And so the first thing, I mean, that's why the money changers' yeah. tables yeah. were in the yeah. temple, right? Like, so the first thing they had to do was to go and exchange something to get the money yeah. to get you know to be able to yeah. pay. Yeah. And I assume that's the status that gold would yeah. also have had. Yeah. Yeah. So that it was an instrument of oppression because the conversion rates for the gold and so on could be very yeah. easily yeah. manipulated. And so people probably felt that yeah. dealing in gold was yeah. quite oppressive and they lost him to that yeah. for a farmer, yeah. for instance. Yeah. So I'm wondering if does that that is participation in that kind of system, that's not a violation of a precept? Yeah, first I, I mean I don't know the details of not the Pindika's way of yeah. the, the details of his livelihood. It's yeah. just that in the commentaries he's described as a safety. Yeah. And what I've read is that the safety class had the function of it arose from the probably from the goldsmiths who were making ornaments, and yeah. then when gold came to be used, it became the medium of, it came to be used as a medium of exchange. Yeah. And so the Saitis were the class that had gold, and then they would use, they would provide gold to the king. Yeah. Or they, yeah, they would provide gold to the king to conduct the affairs of state. Um, the Sainadi was also a disciple of the Buddha, he, there are accounts of him dealing, engaging in a defensive war. Um, you know, I don't know the details of. Right. Well, I, mean, I, I could just trust that Anatta Pindika, as a noble disciple, would not have self, himself been directly responsible for killing and oppressing others. Yeah, yeah, directly. Yeah. But then the way the precepts are written, for instance, you know, I won't approve, I won't support, so yeah. on. 
seems to include indirectly too. And so a little trying to discover mm -hmm. is what's the index of yeah. indirectness yeah. that's crucial here. And I understand that yeah. you know it's quite plausible in his personal relationship. Yeah. Yeah. He's a very decent man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My question is about what his his impact on other people through these indirect relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this I don't, you know, I don't know the details. But one thing that I should mention about Anathapindika, first, Anathapindika was not his actual proper name, but it was a sobriquet, the designation given to him. And it means, Anatta means the helpless, especially orphans and widows and poor people. Yeah. And Pinda means originally a lump, and it has the implication of giving food, so Anatta Pindika was one who gave food and other provisions to, you know, to the orphans, widows, and the poor. Well, is that kind of the equivalent in Buddhist, is, is that kind of the Buddhist equivalent of, say, seeking indulgences in medieval no, Christianity? No, so no, I'm like, okay, I'll, no. I, I'm, I've done these bad no, things, no, so these not, good not people not at all. No, no, it said that he was a very compassionate man that did this out of compassion. Okay, any other questions? Why in the back, Suki? Sariputta, uh, the purpose of calling, I thought, was really to ease the pain. That was what I thought, because he was in such a terrible pain. Yeah. But actually, when Sariputta came, yeah. uh, his Dhamma talk was like a really preparation of a, a, a dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, did he? Give any, I mean, it's a, that Dhamma talk also is just for easing the pain, or that he didn't really uh, care. I mean, that was not the purpose of Sariputta. By easing the pain, I, that would be the job for a physician. <laughs> you mean to console? Right. To console so and uplift? It, yeah, so no one can console. I the, think probably. You know, we don't know so much of the details of the background. You know, whether or not the Pindika thought that he was on the verge of death or just thought he was seriously ill and needed some inspiration, that I don't know. But it seems that Sariputta must have seized the sized up the situation, sized up the situation, and realized, <coughs> realized that Anatta Pindika didn't have much time left. And so his discourse, Sariputta's advice or his exhortation, to, the way I understand it, was based on the understanding that, that Anatta Pindika is about to pass away. So that was the Dharma talk on preparing for the death? I think that was Sariputta's intention. Right. Yeah. Then um, the Sariputta said, you should train thus yeah. and all those. Um, I'm not really uh, uncertain there. How that's like you thinking. You, if you, I will uh, not do this. I will, I will not attach on these. Those are all thinking. Now that's it. How is there any other training that he has to do it in any other sutta that is show? It's just the thinking there. Well, it becomes more than thinking, but it becomes a way of training the mind when <coughs> when these thoughts of clinging to this, this, you know, the sense bases, the sense objects, the feelings, when those thoughts of clinging arise, then he's being trained to dispel those thoughts. And probably, you know, we don't have the full discourse, but maybe Sariputta also said you should train by contemplating all of these things as being nesa vamasmi, nameso vata, 
This is not mine, this is not I, this is not myself. And so even though he is lying, lying down, and though he's very weak because of the illness, but he could still direct his mind to contemplate in that way. And isn't there another sutta also which apparently Anathapindika and Sariputta's relationship goes way back and there is some prior commitment in Sariputta's mind that when this gentleman is going to pass away, he's going to be there for the transmission. I don't know. That why I don't remember, remember, but there is another sutta mm -hmm. In the Sangyuta Nikaya, this is the Sota Pati Sangyuta, the collected discourses on stream entry, where Anatta Pindika is very ill. Right. And I think it's Sariputta that he sends for. That's right, right. It could be Sariputta or Ananda, I have to look at it again. And on that occasion, apparently, they could see that the illness was not as severe as in this case. So the monk who was speaking, whether Ananda or Sariputta, then reminded Anatta Pindika that he was a stream enter, that he possessed the factors of stream entry, and so that he could rejoice in that. Right. Oh, yeah. I just have a couple of questions. Okay. One, one of them is a kind of follow-up to what Suki was asking. Um, would it be correct to say that the term clinging yeah. is could be defined as self-identification. Right? I'd say self-identification self is one aspect. And There's self-identification and also what I would call t t taking possession of or cl claiming possession of. Okay. Yep. So I think, so when you say I will not cling, it's kind of like, uh, you still have like that I... No, will. no, this is just a verb of, of ordinary usage. Oh, okay. All right. In fact, even... The way it's expressed, it even doesn't use the, in Pali, it's, the pronoun isn't necessary. So when you have the verb upadi sami, it's just the first person verb. So the I is implicit in it, but it, it's not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then my other question was uh, do you know the, the reason why lay people chose white as a color? I think it indicates, it's just that it, it indicates purity, because they're observing the precepts of purity. Oh, okay. Okay, I want to, yeah, I want to go on now, because I said we were going to do two suttas. So let us do the advice to Rahula, which is also a very short sutta. And you can see Rahula is a pabajita, he's one who's gone forth, he's a monk. So this is, but he's not dying, he's not dying here. But this is the Buddha's instruction to Rahula. And Rahula yeah, was, as you probably all know, is the Buddha's biological son. So according to the traditional life of the Buddha, um, this much I think may be part of the legend rather than fact, but it said that on the very day that the Buddha decided to renounce the household life and become an ascetic. His wife, Yasodhara, gave birth to a baby boy. And when they had to decide on a name, the Buddha chose the name Rahula because it said that the word Rahula means a fetter. fetter. <laughs> because it's already he was married, so the wife was <laughs> one fetter. <laughs> and now, when he's just about to launch out in his great escapade, his quest for freedom, a little, little boy is born, and that's sort of binding him down, another thing, binding him down to the household life. So he says, the appropriate name is Rahula, a fetter. Okay, but after the Buddha reached enlightenment, when he came back to visit, his native city of Kapalavattu. At that time, Rahula was seven years old, and so his mother points out the Buddha to him and says, you see that ascetic? That is your father. Go ask him for your inheritance. And so Rahula comes to the Buddha, seven-year-old boy, and says, 
please, Father, give me my inheritance. And then the Buddha thinks, if I were to give him, you know, the family wealth, all of the kusak he came from an aristocratic family, the gold and silver and properties, all of those things would just fade in time, in big cups, perhaps even become a cause of bondage and unwholesome activity. Let me give him a truly world-transcending inheritance. And so then the Buddha turns to Sariputta and says, ordain the boy. <laughs> <laughs> and so at the age of seven, Rahula becomes a novice monk. And then the Buddha gives three discourses, or at least there, there were three in the middle length discourses, addressed to Rahula. One of them apparently was given when Rahula was just still a very young boy, and this is sutta number 60, well, 61, which is basically the theme is not to speak falsely, because Perhaps Rahula, as a little boy, a mischievous boy, would give, would maybe exaggerate things and tell, speak falsely to others. So the basic theme is not to speak falsely, and before doing any deed of body, speech, and mind, to reflect on what one is doing, and not do anything that's harmful to oneself, harmful to others. Okay, then when <coughs> There's a discourse, number 62, which was given when Rahula, we could conjecture, according to the commentary, was now probably in his adolescence, you know, 17, 16, 17, 18 years old. I think the commentary says he was 18 years old. So as we could even see a young man coming from royal family, he would have been, had a very physical, Physically, he might have been very handsome, strong, <clears throat> and so he was attached, he, or at least he had the disposition to attachment to this body and pride, what's called the Kshatriya pride. And so the Buddha gave him advice on contemplating the body in terms of the elements and breaking the identification with the body. So that would have been appropriate to him and then going on to give him instruction in mindfulness of breathing as a meditation object. And now we come to this discourse where the Buddha is going to give him the instruction that leads him to our object, to the final goal. And so the sutta starts when the Buddha is alone in meditation and then he thinks I don't like this word deliverance, but I prefer, it's vimutti, which is liberation. The states that ripen in liberation have ripened in Rahula. Suppose I were to lead him on further to the destruction of the asavas, the destruction of the defilements. So what are these states that ripen in deliverance, ripen in liberation. So, according to the commentary, the commentary mentions the five spiritual faculties, that is faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. So through the years, Rahula must have been training himself based on the instruction that the Buddha gave in the earlier sutta on contemplating the body as being not self by way of the elements through mindfulness of breathing and in this way he would have developed his practicing vigorously, he's developing energy doing all of this with mindfulness so he's strengthening his mindfulness as his mindfulness strengthens he develops samadhi and then he's been contemplating the three characteristics, impermanence, dukkha, non-self, in the body and the other, <coughs> the other aggregates. 
Okay, so this is the commentarial explanation. But I found that there's this, another sutta that uses this expression, the states or factors that ripen in liberation. This is called the Megiya Sutta, which occurs in the Udana as Sutta number, well, I didn't write it down, it's 30, yeah, I think it's Sutta number 31 in the Udana. And it also occurs in the Ankutta Nikaya, the numerical discourses, Book of Nines. I think it's Sutta number two in the Book of Nines. So here, the Buddha mentions five things. He says there, there are these five things that ripen in liberation. When the mind is not yet ripened for liberation, these are the five things that ripen in liberation. So the five things he mentions there, the first is good friendship, associating with good, worthy friends spiritual friends. Then the second is sila, that is observing proper moral discipline or moral conduct. Then comes having the chance to listen to uplifting Dhamma talks, talks that open the mind and inspire the mind. Then comes energy, striving vigorously to abandon unwholesome mental states and develop wholesome mental states. And then comes panya, wisdom or insight into the arising and passing away of things. Okay, so then the Buddha says that when based upon these five things, then one develops four things further. And these are the four meditation objects. So the Buddha here says, one develops the perception of the unattractive nature of the body as the antidote to sensual lust. One develops metta, loving kindness, as the antidote to ill will. One develops mindfulness of breathing, in order to abandon distracting thoughts. And then one develops the perception of impermanence in order to arouse or generate the perception of non-self. Okay, so these are another set. Actually, the two are not completely different. We have the five spiritual faculties, which include energy and wisdom, well, and then we have the five factors mentioned in the Megya Sutta and the four meditation objects which lead to samadhi and to insight. So the two sets overlap. So Rahula must have been developing these factors over the years and now they're all mature, his mind is right at that point, just you know, every, all the accumulations or, or all of the contributing factors have been accumulated. He just needs a discourse from the Buddha to trigger off the final realization. And so now the Buddha calls him and they want to go off to have, have a private talk. And then it said on that occasion Many thousands of deities follow the Buddha, thinking, today the Blessed One will lead the Venerable Rahula to the, destruct, to the destruction of the Asavas. And according to the commentary, these deities had previously, in a past life, had been companions of Rahula <laughs> when Rahula made his first determination, in the future I want to become the personal son of a Buddha. Then those thousands of his friends were present. Well, having thousands of friends seems an exaggeration. <laughs> but that's what the commentary says. 
And so they were present and they rejoiced in his aspiration. And then through their own merits they had been reborn in the celestial realms. And now they must have been able to know what is taking place in the human realm and realize that Rahula is about to make, to, to achieve the final realization. And so they all gather to hear this discourse. Okay, so then the Buddha gives Rahula a discourse basically on the three characteristics applied to the six sense bases. So the eye, now we've gone over this before and we'll come to it again, so I'm not going, and the time is very limited, so I'm not going to explain the principles in detail, but we have the eye, ear, nose, etc., are all impermanent, dukkha, and non-self. And then the Buddha goes through the six sense objects, the six types of consciousness, six types of contact, six types of feeling. So you see, this is um, reproducing the same content that we found in the discourse to Ananta Pindika. And so all of them are impermanent, dukkha, non-self. And then in paragraph what's given here is 428, the Buddha also brings in, since the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, as well as their objects are material objects, so that represents the form aggregate. Now, and then the Buddha has spoken about consciousness as well, but, well here he brings in the mental factors that arise through contact associated with feeling. But he says, is anything comprised within the feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness that arise with mind contact as condition, is that permanent or impermanent? Then he goes through the three characteristics. Okay, so now in those paragraphs, the Buddha is giving what we call the basic groundwork or material for the development of insight wisdom, seeing all the factors of experience as impermanent, unsatisfactory, and non-self. Then comes the consequence of that insight. Seeing thus, the noble disciple becomes disenchanted with the eye forms, eye consciousness, and so on. So we have here disenchantment, a kind of inner disillusionment with them and turning away from them. Then he becomes disenchanted with all of these other groups of objects. Then there, in my edition, the paragraph was missing. Somehow it dropped out. I don't know which edition you have, but let's see if it's there. It should go, when he becomes disenchanted, then he becomes dispassionate. When he becomes dispassionate, his mind is liberated. And when his mind is liberated, then there comes the knowledge. It's liberated. And he understands birth is finished. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. Now there is no more coming back to this. You have that in your edition? Okay, so mine is an older edition. Okay, so that is what the Blessed One said, and then it's, the text continues that the Venerable Rahula re was satisfied and he rejoiced in the Buddha's words, and while all the discourse was being spoken, then through not clinging, you see, the end of Upadana, the Venerable Rahula's mind was liberated from the asavas, from the taints. And in those many thousands of deities, there arose the spotless, immaculate vision of the Dhamma. All that is subject to arising is subject to cessation. Okay, that formula means that these deities, they didn't become with regard to Rahula, 
the mind liberated from the asavas, that means he achieved arahatsya, the final stage of the path. But in the case of these many thousands of deities, they gain the direct insight realization of the Dhamma. Which means they don't be, at this point, they don't become arahats, but they become either stream enterers, once returners, maybe in some cases non returners, the lower three stages. Okay, that's a pretty quick run through the Rahula Sutta. Okay, I think we have to go up for the meal now, but we'll come back and then we can take up any further questions or comments, points for discussion. Let's do it a little because you have to walk down 1230 and we'll be back here. Okay, so let us end with the sharing of the merits. Okay, I'll just recite the verses. By now you should memorize them. <laughs> okay, so we share the merit with the thousands of devas and the buddhas, the yakshas, the dragon's births. Akasata jabhumata deva naga mahidika Punyanta Nanuma Ditva Chirang Rakantu Desanam. Oh, I'm sorry. I should, it should be speaking about uh, memorization. Chirang Rakantu Sasanam. Akasa Ta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Nanuma Ditva Chirang Rakantu Desanam. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyanta nanumal dipa chiram rakantu mang param e ta vatacham he he sampadam punya sampadam sabe deva numodam tu sabha sampati sedia e ta vatacham he he sampadam punya sampadam Sabe bhutanamo dantu, sabha sampati sedya, eta vatacham hehi sampadam punya sampadam, sabe satanamo dantu, sabha sampati sedya, pavagupadaya avijitato, etantare satakayupapana, rupia rupicha, asanya sanino. Dukha Pamuchantu Pusantu Nibuting Okay, now we end with three half hours to do them. Testing one, two, three.
question anyone Bandi, the understanding or it could be interpreted that in both the suttas today, um, the, is it possible that there is some kind of an oral transmission of enlightenment that the Buddha or any of the teachers give? Is it like, you know, it's not like a translation or a discourse, but does some level of... Um, I don't know how to put it. You know, it's like in modern day terminology, people talk about energy transmission. You know what I mean? You mean like the Indian concept of Shaktipat? <laughs> That's right. Where the master touches the disciple. And the person and, is enlightened or yeah. reaches some level of enlightenment. So I'm just wondering, is there anywhere in the suttas, is there something like oral transmission that just by talk, people realize great things? There is something like that. I don't know about the phrase oral transmission, but in many suttas, when the Buddha gives a discourse, those who are listening, especially when the Buddha sees that somebody is mature, then he'll give the discourse that's directed specifically to that person's capacities and faculties, and then that person will achieve one of the levels of realization just on the spot. And sometimes this happens even with those who, at least in this life, haven't done any what we call medi formal right. meditation practice, right. but they must have accumulated what we call the paramis over many previous lives. And so their faculties are quite mature, quite ripe. So just, and then I would assume that when, that the Buddha's physical presence generates like an enormous spiritual energy. So it's, we don't see anything like the Shakti part there, <laughs> but when the Buddha is teaching, somehow he's able to direct the teaching precisely to that person, and just through the, I guess, the precision of the Buddha's discourse and his own spiritual power, the person who listens achieves realization. Yeah, sometimes that even goes up to, to the attainment of arahatship. Really? Yeah, so that there are some discourses I think one that we'll come to, it says that as the Buddha was speaking this discourse, the minds of the 60 monks who were listening, their minds were freed from the asavas. But there's previous work, obviously, that those monks oh, have yeah, already yeah. attained. I mean, they would have done... It's not like a miracle. <laughs> no, it's not, nothing is like a miracle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the only miracles are flying through the sky. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. It was on. Um, Bhante, a question I have is, you, I don't know if I heard it correctly, but you said something about a stream enterer before, and that he never may go beyond that point. Somehow I... I didn't say that a stream enterer might not go beyond that point. What I said is that, in, this is in relation to Anatta Pindika, I don't recall any suttas which speak about him, him in that life going beyond stream entry. Okay. So that it seems that through his life, of course, he would have continued as a stream enterer. But I don't see any sutta which said that he achieved the stage of a once returner. So basically, a stream enterer could be a stream enterer for a very long time. Yeah, I Possibly. mean. Possibly. Yeah. One can continue through the rest of one's life as a stream enterer, even for several lives. But once one becomes a stream enterer, then one is bound to reach full liberation. At some point. It said in a maximum of seven lives. Of course, it seems like a long time. If you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, Richard, I just want to, there's a book that just occurred to me during lunch. It's called The Social Dimension of Early Buddhist social dimension of early Buddhism, it might yeah. have some discussion of the, of the Satis or Shreshis mm -hmm. there. Yes, they also, regarding the, the seven lifetime rule for stream enterers, yeah. the thing that strikes me about that is you see that's, that's also 
what was the rule for changing castes in Hindu India at the time. Because the idea was that the people who wanted to advance in caste mm could do so, but it would take seven lifetimes. So I, I, I think that the reason that, or that is traditionally that that number, you know, that is seven lifetimes was something which was plausible at the time mm. to, to Indians because of the Hindu rule that it took seven lifetimes to change castes. I think one might have to look into the chronology of texts there because huh? But when we have to see whether the texts which present the idea that it takes seven lifetimes to change caste yeah. preceded mm -hmm. the time of the Buddha or came after. Mm. This I don't know. Okay. But it could be that they all came after. Mm. And just seven is a number. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't mean that a stream enterer has to go through seven lives. Somebody could go from stream entry to arahant in this life, as many of the Buddha's disciples did, or they can go in this life from stream enterer to once returner to non returner. You know, so, seven lives is only given as the maximum, not as a fix. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Bonte, um, just on when you're on the path, it's um, since we talked about uh, divine beings earlier. Yeah. Is there anything in the sutras that says where the divine beings can assist you on a noble eightfold path, or is it just you yourself, your own? Yeah, effort. when I when I use the expression divine beings, I'm not speaking about anything that corresponds to the theistic idea of a god. Oh yeah, no, no, I mean yeah. like the devas and yeah. yeah, there are actually accounts that come in the text of sometimes. I'm thinking of a sutta where there was it's called the Bahya Sutta. There was an ascetic who thought that he was an arahant, and then. You know, he lived, he must have lived sometime in that belief. Then it said that a deity came to him and told him, you are not an arhat or even on the path to arhatship. <laughs> and then that sort of shocked him. And then he asked, he must have realized it was true. Then he asked, well, where can I find an arhat? Then the deity said, well, if you go to Savati, there's somebody there that they call the Buddha. You should see him. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, there are accounts like that in the suttas. How this would work in our own real life. It could be that the deities that they don't appear to us in in their supernatural flesh and blood, but sometimes ideas come into our mind right. that help us in our development. And where do these ideas come from? You know, it might just come seemingly out of nowhere. Like, go see that person. He could give give you advice. That idea suddenly comes, or I should go see this person. Right. And that idea could be planted in our minds without our knowing it by a deity. Thanks. But even though such things could take place, maybe the Buddha doesn't speak about them very much because if he did, people would start to get lazy and think, oh, I don't really have to do anything. I just, you know, offer some incense and flowers to the deity. Maybe it's a combination of your own effort and maybe a little bit of assistance. Yeah, I think that there can be some super uh, spiritual beings in other dimensions who are helping us along the path just through infusing us with their spiritual energy or suggesting ideas to us. And then there's the idea of some beings that are trying to do the opposite, right? Like, oh, yeah. Like Those are the de demonic beings or yeah. the, the Mara and his assistants. <laughs> Thank you. Bhante, I have a question about uh, the jhanas in terms of the notion of absorption. Yeah. Um, as opposed to the idea of a trance state. 
yeah. I, sometimes I've seen it, you know, connected to the idea of a trance, but absorption, uh, you want has to still be fully alert and mindful. Yeah, I don't like the, the rendering of trance no, at all. No, that's why I want to get a I don't clarification know. of that. Yeah, I don't know why some of the early translators used trance, but I think it's completely fallen out of favor now. Because in jhana, there's clear awareness. It's not going into a, 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 a state below the threshold of ordinary consciousness, but rather above ordinary consciousness. So it's just a question of how one, you know, when you are meditating, you don't, you feel you're free of thought, you're sort of, have bare attention to your breath, how you might distinguish that from an, a state of more deeper absorption. No, there are other phenomena that come that indicate absorption. It's not just being focused one pointedly on the object, but what's called the jhana factors have to arise, and then the mind has to remain unwavering on that object you know, so that the sense of the ordinary sensory world surrounding us has passed out, has vanished. That the mind is, I, maybe absorption gives the sense. Yeah, thank you. But it's a kind of sustained, deep sustained. And then it's accompanied by, well, even before one is into the full jhana, there's the arising of the qualities like joy and bliss. Okay, any further questions? Okay, if no further questions, then we'll stop for the day. We covered a lot of territory, two suttas today, but they were both short. And then next week, as I mentioned, we will take suttas, for, for, sutta 44, a very controversial sutta, as you'll see. So stir up a little, we have to have like the coming attractions or preview. <laughs> a point that's been debated by, even by contemporary Buddhists back and forth in learned journals, scholarly journals, and at the more popular level. And then Sutta number 45, which we, is, we could just take very briefly, 45. Did you say? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said 45. Oh, I'm sorry. It's 144 and 145. Okay, so let us end then with three half bows again. Okay, one. Two, three.